It's always not the easiest thing to present to your own school, to your own university, because I consider myself to be very familiar with by uh, colleagues like uh, um, Professor uh, Banerjee and uh, er, uh, Professor Hikla. But also, um, since we're all in this uh, USC community addressing urban issues and built environment and all and on and on, and felt like we probably have a lot of uh, agenda that's shared and common. So, and then to, to give a very provocative lecture, it became very difficult. And I always uh, do that too when I go outside and I can see anything I want and I just be really kind of intense in certain ways. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, I think the topic here, uh, which um, as the computer being uh, prepared is about uh, density and diversity. Um, when, er, uh, when I was introduced by, uh, by Professor uh, Banerjee on uh, being labeled in China as an iconic kind of uh, designer who can constantly deliver uh, buildings that are catching people's eyes and constantly being kind of debated and controversial uh, for that matter. Uh, but my real interest is actually on the density and diversity issue, which obviously is a um, not only an urban issue, uh, maybe uh, definitely go beyond uh, architectural agenda. It's something about the kind of emerging problems of the place, which uh, may or may not be addressed, but definitely sensed by the scale of urbanism and how city is being perceived and planned and built. Uh, being an architect in that environment, you have no chance to be part of that debate and part of that effort which is different from, the, uh, from what's, uh, what, what is uh, um, being operated here, because cities are largely built still there with maybe two step kind of falling behind, still built by people with their hands. Decisions on cities are still made by people who have many um, uh, uh, um, life aspects in the uh, forming period of what we call traditional city. So in other words, architects in that arena plays a major role, uh, no matter how city will be planned. As soon as architects get in it, and it could change the whole course, uh, many times it changes to worse uh, situation. So our role as architect actually being noted in uh, West media about icon makings, but actually is participate in that kind of grassroots textural quality of the urban uh, development. So um, we have to constantly debate with, in our routine work, not even intellectual level, it's how density that's never going to be addressed without killing of diversity, which in China there's huge tendency that all the cities are now in whatever the kind of universal analytical tools and probably the design tools and the construction tools and the diversity and differences in different cities are being <coughs> wiped out. So I thought that's maybe the area, being an architect, we can contribute most. When we go in, we can always bring in something that violates the planning. Um, sorry. <laughs> 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 that, that kind of diversify what the planning calls for and addressing issues that is not easily addressed in the uh, tool sets we've all ed educated in our planning. It's still possible in China uh, for many reasons, and you probably know more than I do in this, but in a, you know, from policy level to all the execution level, the opening or the cracks that participate into it and inject positive energy in the city making is still possible. Um, so that's kind of luxuriousness of the uh, backwardness, sometimes primitive way of making cities, because if you really do have a good idea and you're so responsible to it, you can actually change the course. I always think we can change the course, although my colleagues never thought um, that is a possible scheme. But I think in this sense, we're becoming uh, kind of this double agent. We represent uh, architects using icon names to get uh, participate in the urban process in the same time, um, retool and uh, divide, redevise the process. So I'm bringing some projects that shows how our work actually is in that process as kind of means of dialogue. Um, first, I have to get this out of the way. <laughs> okay. 
Um, so th this is a project, huge, huge project that's probably uh, one and a half million square meter and both basement and all the towers in one of the prominent sites in Shenzhen. Uh, and this is actually for high-tech uh, campus. So our approach is to uh, fill the whole site with the absolutely highest density and using light, sunlight to cut. Imagine the whole block filled 100% coverage, go to the top tallest uh, height limit and then using sunlight to penetrate through it to carve, to, uh, to deduct all the excessive volumes, masses in this kind of pre-assumed maximized coverage and density. So as you're carving it away, then the forms of buildings start to emerge and then the street uh, quality, this is how it's being carved out, almost like a pixel, right, in the whole so then this is, you got a site plan. This is how uh, the building becomes. So if you uh, look up, uh, above the sky and, uh, and then you look down, there's actually, you can, uh, the carving uh, logics can also organize itself in urban spaces on different hierarchy. And then you can imagine lives, actually, vegetation. So the process of it, it starts with a very abstract mathematical uh, uh, take but then constantly inject in the urban qualities and spatial qualities that we're familiar with. And even in the most basic modular, this is, this is cause for a small office park, a startup company with animation. Uh, as you know, Shenzhen is now labeled as this creative, digital creative industry based. So they're gonna attract a lot of um, animation uh, young talents. And you probably also know a lot of Korean and Japanese cartoons are actually all sourced in this area. So a lot of young people participated in this global uh, to, um, uh, um, gaming and website design and flash. This is, this is a kind of, so in a way the theme of pixel mounds and pixel city and incorporated with small unit living, uh, live work uh, program seems come together and obviously uh, as it go down to the basement uh, so you can still create a kind of well protected not hostile urban environment as most of Shenzhen is actually creating so this is actually the so in a way it recalls to like the Manhattan kind of set it back uh, system which actually has nothing to do with weather which only have property right and the value. So this, no, uh, no sense is so much different, but is morphed by the kind of sunlight and program both from inside and outside. And this, uh, it can be beautiful as well. So, um, like every project in China, we have to give up, uh, we have to deliver this type of drawings. So it's design, uh, it's planning, but in the same time, vision and uh, reality. So. If you're familiar with the practice, uh, urban practice in that part of the world, it is always have to um, pre-announce um, the reality, even though it's not so real. So there is kind of this internal uh, polemical or paradox inside. So you start with highly um, abstract um, scheme, but then you have to end it in two months of period of design. It has to be real. In other words, it has to look buildable and all that. So it's a great luxury. You have to kind of, in the fastest speed, ranging your mind from very abstract scheme to absolutely kind of reliable, at least visually, uh, the kind of uh, reality. So this idea of pixel, uh, pixel City, it expanded into another project, which uh, you probably see all the tissues. I'm not going to go through this. This are uh, pixels with three and three meter congregates into groups and strips that define different, indicate different program, urban spaces, and uh, density. Um, so we, this, should I do this? Okay, so this diagram is this. Let me explain this. This is the overall FAR, the complete density if you fill the whole city, this is actually a quarter of a city called Zhengzhou. Zhengzhou, some of your Chinese students probably know, is in the middle of China. 
is on the Euro Asia train line, and that city is so screwed up by, uh, <laughs> uh, yes, by uh, by uh, by our like most respected uh, Kishu Kurokawa, Japanese uh, modern master, but he basically single-handedly screwed the city up. So we try to by 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 designing a huge circle of like 20 kilometer big with water. A city has no water, but with artificial water pumps like bigger than LA. Anyway, so we thought maybe that is too, we can come back to the city and really uh, think the city as, those little dots are pixels. They're like a seed. Uh, in China, particularly in this city, uh, every uh, citizen, like individual citizens are called uh, shu, which is seed of cereal, a wheat or rice. We are all seed, right? So, uh, but all the uh, um, higher power to form the population or any rules, laws that have formed our way of life, that became intelligence dealing with individual seeds. This is high political, it's like through the political career, all the emperors call them intelligence of seeds. In other words, the seeds grow certain where well, the seeds will grow. So, city is made of seeds. So we call it a seed city, S-E-E-D. And uh, so there is a little animation here I wanted to. So how the seeds, the wheat, are being grouped together and planted. Chuding. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, Shongji, <coughs> right? <coughs> is it music? So this is talking about the intelligence of seed. So is the city of intelligence seed? Is it going or? It also has a music, but as probably you know that I just put this together not too long ago. <laughs> Does it moves actually? Oh, 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 sorry. So it's talking about transparency, flexibility, agility, and also the kind of resilience of the quality of seeds. It's too long, right? Seven, three minutes. So this is the whole whole area for our planning is quarter. So the canal, the, the biggest Chinese canal, the aqua duct, is running through, scraping through the site. There's a train line through the site. Um, and then there's three uh, existing urban streets are being planned running through the site. And then the kind of optimal depth for street, uh, for programs along the street, or internal to between the three, two streets. Those are the cultural nodes and community centers. They are differences, they're the monuments per se, both in space or building. So the whole, so this is the seed, the pixel coming here. So how are they gonna pile onto the city? So the, if you, we had a parametric model, if you change the density of the road, <coughs> the city will start to, kind of, at certain threshold, the structure changes, maintaining the same exact uh, FAR, and then as the landscape uh, scheme dials up, it also, but the white part, which is are the pileation, compilation of seeds, are the same. Can we stop this? I'm, I'm gonna. Oh. Then the differences is brought in with the seas of. Um,
this is the icon part. The, <laughs> the mayors, the mayors uh, sometimes don't understand seeds well. This may not look uh, anything different uh, to cities we know, but if you know Zhengzhou, that against this Baroque huge monumental planning, this actually is something they really need. Very uh, dense uh, street um, and very kind of uh, life embracing, dif uh, diversity enabling urban scheme that is not. Um so this are th uh, this part of that uh, met parametric uh, kind of self generate generating modeling. This I'm just gonna go quickly that along the canal. Um, obviously, the density of it, the argument for it is Zhengzhou is a very populated city. It goes horizontal crazily. Uh, last 10 years, it's already expanded four times along the young, uh, Yellow River to the east. So the idea is really to redraw the city and densify its inner core. This is actually right a quadrant right next to the center of that two towers. So how to actually densify the, not encourage density in the city instead of spreading it out, constantly searching for new residential building types, which is something that is many cities that are missing the point in China. So this is actually regaining the density for a very populated region. Um, this is, um, well, we lost the, comp that was a competition, we didn't win. So this is uh, in outside Ningbo, uh, another a city that is very typical in China. It's rice pets, uh, but basically have nothing 10 years ago. Now it grow into a couple million uh, a new city. So our area of concern is that orange tea. This was actually a planning that's done by Tsinghua University. We were brought in to basically comb through and then densify it to a very non-Chinese urban type. So it's actually uh, more to, uh, one third uh, denser than 25% or well, one third denser than Manhattan. Very, very small footprint. And the whole basement are completely shared. So each building never has its own basement. Uh, in China, when, you, when the lot is given to a developer, they do two set of ramps, two cores, and everything is on their own. So even though the buildings are very next to each other, the basement is never connected. So the city main comes in, all the infrastructure they always have to do. So you basically multiply the waste of infrastructure and the effectiveness of shared common facility by as much as the building blocks is divided. So we actually come in, advise the city to generate a large floor plate that every developer put, create a trust or a fund give to the city and build the whole basement all at once. So you save 20 ramps and all the cars is just so generous. So in that way, we hold more parking, much 30 or 40% more parking if every lot has their own infrastructure. And then the city uh, infrastructure comes through the basement with a duct that easily accessible, re uh, re uh, maintained instead of Many of you in China, every time there's something wrong with the pipe, they have to open the ground and the whole thing, you know, like the ground is constantly be covered, open, covered, and fixing all the pipes. This one is actually basement. Once the city comes, infrastructure comes in, the whole basement is all shared, accessible. I'm just gonna go through uh, some, then such a big city are built at once, and how do you introduce differences in different building blocks? Otherwise, it's very generic anonymous and how do you kind of introduce a uh, different identity so that different corporation comes here to adopt a lot and got adopt a building. This is one of the very few case that all the buildings are preconceived before developer come in. Uh, as you know, mo many times uh, developer come in, they want to do anything they want. This actually is one of the very few that actually everything is thought out before by Tsinghua University and we together. So this is some, and then we identify a river running through the neighborhood uh, community and creating a kind of canal bond 
commercial, F&B, entertainment, just create a whole kind of lifestyle issue for a rather-wise uh, very uh, gene generic, life-lacking, uh, 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 large uh, uh, mixed-use development. And obviously, uh, this is the eye-catching part. So, so obviously, uh, buildings has to be so attractive, so the local confidence from different business community will come. This is actually a restaurant on top of the river. It's a violation of a policy of rule. You probably know the river belongs to the public property, and there's an air right. Uh, so you can never build a building over public property. But um, so s some new business have to form from the government's office to run it, operate it as public facility, yet service for the kind of enrichment of the uh, program. And uh, uh, so I thought this, uh, so it all started from almost pixelated again. This is the whole basement. So this is um, uh, almost like our pixel pixelated model. So this is how the extrusion comes. So there are about 50-some uh, buildings that we have either designed advised or given guidelines of the aspects and how they related. And the small street constantly are, there are small street that are moving through this, forming that uh, kind of, this is the canal being dried. Those are the, those are the bridge, actually they're building it. Okay, so now, um, that's uh, on the construction. Is still we've been on that project for the last uh, five years already. This is a project now back to Shenzhen. Um, Shenzhen is a city that developed from the right side of the picture, goes way to the west. In about ten years, it transformed from a three thousand fishermen village to uh, now kind of six four million uh, four to six million uh, center core and was the other peripheral. The city developed so fast that actually what happened is very funny. You, you, you leave a lot of these unattended green uh, bumps. They're like little hills. Not much like uh, LA, because it happens so fast. And any land that has some difficulty, it will escape. So just leave a lot of, I call them regenerative voids. They're actually important for the city, for the future brief. And uh, so fast now, the development now go across this mountain on the north side, go over to the site here. Um, so this is a call for 10 universities, 10 colleges coming to Shenzhen uh, to have a base for it. Um, this is actually existing site in the mountain. All the light blue, the blue ones are all illegal construction in Shenzhen. When I call it illegal, those are the structures that not having permit or any formal contract with anybody. But nonetheless, those blue buildings that help Shenzhen be in Shenzhen, they're actually uh, agricultural industrial setups in the early 80s when the uh, uh, township or agricultural industrial setup um, taking place. A lot of manufacture, small scale businesses or taking place in this very uh, kind of vague zone of construction. Um, but although they're illegal, but they're highly uh, intelligent. I always thought the less legal action are the most intelligent ones because they have to happen fast. They have to move, they have to be light and they can be demolished anytime they want. So in other words, the investment is always minimum. So there is this kind of built-in intelligence in this kind of proliferation of the illegal s uh, industrial buildings. So, and they are very easy to build. That means there's not a lot of site work. So that kind of intelligence. But this is actually Princeton University. Um, it's, the uni it's a pr paradigm of high education. Uh, so we say no to the <laughs> Because uh, if you would imagine if you build Princeton on that hill, uh, 10 university, uh, the footprint will cover the whole mountain. You will have left with no landscape at all. So that the density of that kind of uh, less uh, legal construction shows us. So we actually marked where the most kind of the early generations of that illegal campaign uh, movement of construction 
identify where are the most sensitive zone to allow buildings taking place. But obviously, there are 10 universities. You can't put all of them. So we have to, we proposed a tower for 10 universities to go on. So it's one tower for 10 colleges, uh, but they, um, that's not well, well received. So we thought we, then we can split into three towers. Uh, one of them can be fixed as a phase one. The other two can constantly moving. Uh, the, the reason for that is there's the re demolition relocation uh, operation that's highly political and difficult. So the second tower and third tower can happen where the demolition goes the most smoothly. In other words, they can't demolish everything at once. It will ruin the economy in the same time. So our advice is to kind of reduce the footprint and really kind of almost like a chess playing to place strategically in the most political safe, environmental sensitive, and programmatic uh, meaningful location for the building. So these are one of the tower. Uh, I'm just gonna go very quickly. Um, so they are, uh, basically Shenzhen is a place everything grows. If you don't uh, mind them, they, they will grow into your window a couple days. Uh, green mows and you know, vines and everything grows. So our building is actually a large uh, plates for plants and uh, the building perimeter set back minimally eight meter from the edge of the building. And so to create this kind of uh, mountain-like uh, uh, college uh, clusters. Uh, so th those are the, the 200,000 square meters, two million square feet. Um, so we combine all the college together. Instead, of each college has its own administration, library, uh, computer lab, and labs. So all of them put their same color program together. We generate one administration, one. So it's a high, highly kind of um, integrated or consolidated uh, program. This is the building of the building. So the form of the building isn't uh, actually casual. They're actually exercised by the annual wind uh, pattern. So there, this is highly mountain area. So there is software that calculate how the winds come through the valley and penetrate through this. If you think all the buildings are cotton uh, sugar, like very soft, and you keep blowing very lightly the dominant prevailing wind patterns, it actually that wind will slowly, slowly form that building into somewhat of a uh, zone of um, most effective uh, natural ventilation based on where they are. Uh, so that's the kind of wind pattern. You can see that the glazing, it happens uh, uh, from the edge, but because it's di different directionality, the setback between the edge to the plate and the perimeter are constantly changing as well based on their direction. Uh, it's in the mountain, so uh, we're planning 15% of the energy used will be through uh, through uh, geothermal in the lakes that deeper in the mountain. Uh, but obviously we have windmills on top. That I, we don't know whether that works. It just look uh, funny. So we thought, we thought uh, it has like a uh, moving hair. <laughs> um, so these are the kind of spaces in between the cavity of the, of the, the volumes. This is actually is also an a international competition. Obviously, we realize this is not the easiest building to kind of digest. So we try to make it as real as possible and trying to put figures and classrooms and labs and so that impress the jury by how much we actually know to work on, to, to, to operate this building. This is the three of them together. This is the interior inside. Um, so the message is actually create a green uh, college green university by learn how to use the building instead of create anti-green campus but learning green, green knowledge is in, in the kind of non-green classroom. So this, you have to really learn how to use the building. It's not the easiest. So in a way, the university became a universe that actually learn how to live green and with the green building. Um, it rather, rather than another way around. So, um, so just by putting the model together, it needs a lot of uh, learning. So 
we didn't win the competition, uh, obviously, because uh, we used too little of a land. But more importantly, the, the head of the jury is the former uh, dean from Princeton. <laughs> uh, was Ralph Lerner, now is the dean of Hong Kong University. Uh, he participated in all juries. I think we showed that Princeton no sign it was bad strategy. So we lost, <laughs> <laughs> we lost the competition. But uh, like every competition we do, it's a platform uh, to keep us constantly thinking what can we improve, uh, what can we do with the same idea but different adaptation uh, application to this is actually a, a, a call for proposal for the West Kowloon land reclamation. In West Kowloon there's a large land reclamation that half of it is used by uh, a conglomeration of developers to develop the tallest towers in Kowloon but there's still a land left land left. You see that? So uh, basically we quickly propose the th three piles of some green something onto the land uh, to kind of pr uh, provoke the eyes of the administrator. Uh, those, so the three months that actually line up with this Kowloon, West Kowloon land reclamation. Uh, I go back to the, to the section because it's almost like vertical city in the uh, university case is just cavity for when in this case is actually all the cultural facilities are actually in, uh, wrapped almost like a dumpling in uh, inside. So the residential became the wrapper and the cultural became the, the, the content of that dumpling. So the competition was called for about 10 cultural facilities in Hong Kong. It's the most strange, it's the strangest thing Hong Kong done last couple years. You know, only places that they will launch like an architectural campaign for theaters, museums, are either Abu Dhabi or uh, Afghanistan, uh, or um, um, uh, what is the city north of Mongolia? Um, uh, all the cities that they're so afraid that they have no cultural uh, foundation, therefore they're so eager to use architecture, you know, Abu Dhabi, Dubai, and all this. Why Hong Kong need the same thing? Hong Kong has been a cultural center in the Canton area for, uh, for th hundreds of years. And it's already been a center of trade. It's already been a center of banking. It's already a center of food. Why does Hong Kong have to be a center of culture again? It's the weirdest thing. So this is a highly uh, polemical. So if Hong Kong actually embraced this project, that means Hong Kong is not confident of its cultural maturity. If Hong Kong not doing it, and then he'd been perceived not embracing cultural in Hong Kong. So somehow the desert of uh, culture, it's never gonna get away. So, so, um, so our proposal is not built like highly polished cultural buildings that uh, architectural kind of manifesto, but actually embed them into residential buildings that Hong Kong are mostly needed, particularly in West Kowloon. Uh, more argument will come. So this is the uh, this is the kind of uh, so we propose um, uh, this three uh, things on this site. It actually go along with you know in Hong Kong those mountains are highly mystical. Uh, this is called ridges. If you encroach the skyline, you are you're just criminal. Uh, but um, but this is actually bring the skyline onto a land that is. Um, so what's more important is this. This is actually public land. Hong West Kowloon, this is actually at the end of West Kowloon. West Kowloon has a large problem of urban redevelopment. Many housing, 80% housing are running down, lack of utilities. But the government constantly trying to group the campaign of urban redevelopment. But they can't relocate people. They can't do it. So we propose the land of that reclamation plays as a land swap campaign. So basically identify the most urgent area in West Kowloon need to be redeveloped it, using this public reclaimed land to exchange. So building 20 year kind of uh, mid-term uh, uh, res residential buildings to kind of enable the, the, enable the cycle of redevelopment through West Kowloon. So that's the fair use of public land. 
not about 10 opera theaters, five MoMAs and three LACMAs. They, they are, they, you know, their business is bad anyway. So how can those museums, how can Asia have another opera, I mean, three opera halls, if Shanghai already have five of them? I don't understand why Hong Kong has to have them. But anyway, there's a large chunk of tax has to be used. So we propose that actually three piles, not only re, uh, residential, wrapping, uh, cultural, but also creating a land swap kind of uh, scheme for the government. That's the best thing that to Hong Kong residents, not, uh, not LACMA, not uh, Guggenheim, uh, not uh, Opera House, um, because they do have it anyway. So those are the four sites that I identify through West Kowloon being kind of re redeveloped it using the, uh, the re reclamate line. So this is now I move to back to uh, Shanghai. This is actually North Bund. This is the this is the Bund. There's a whole area that's not being developed. Those are the that's a very interesting area where the mixture of in old Shanghai the 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 there's a slide. so the the concession or the colonial town is on the lower left side. So that area north of the river, facing south, is also foreign settlement, but is the third and th uh, second and third class of foreign. So those are the areas foreigners are mixed with Chinese in the most organic way. In old concessions, they're actually separated. This area, the you know Jap um, working Japanese population, Russian, uh, British, and Chinese, and oh, most importantly Jewish. Uh, settlement are also most there. So this is area left unattended until about five, six years ago, even before the expo. So those are the, so you're looking north from the Bund. So we, um, obviously that area, the reason it has not shown any evidence of movement is because it's so dense, it's absolutely dense, it's impossible to relocate any population and not hurting the political scene. And so we um, were, actually brought in by a developer, Van Ke, the biggest developer, who wants to get the land, but he has to come up with a planning. So we were kind of uh, being consulted. So we introduced uh, what I called five major cuts through the area, perpendicular to the Huangpu River, and five very thin cuts, uh, missing two points in between. So it's like the Osman plan for Paris. It's like you, how you can actually generate cuts through the cities that can stimulate bringing new germs in and stimulate new type of life organization that actually break through the kind of rather stifle, um, very dense, impossible kind of urban move. And uh, <laughs> so those are the master planning, as you can see those uh, green bands cuts through. Um, each of the bands actually carries different uh, uh, organizing principles of urban life. Sorry, the pictures are uh, everywhere. The Venice, that's uh, Rotterdam, uh, New York. Uh, so this is advertisement material. Uh, but um, so those are the major cuts. But then they're next to the major cut, alternating. They're the historical cores. So the spines of historical uh, fabric. So those are actually kind of uh, being researched and studied and actually uh, meander through between the five major cuts. Uh, I call the first set of cuts um, a big cut. What's the, what's the knife you I use? Cut uh, grasses in the farm. Side side. So, yeah, those are those cuts. But th this cut are the Chinese butcher's cuts. Have you heard the legendary uh, good bo Chinese butcher? Uh, who have a knife never sharpened because he never touched the bones. He just cut between the muscles, between the tissues. It, you know, anyway, so one of those <laughs> Chinese. So it's like, a, so those are the kind of uh, farmer's cuts, right? Very straightforward, ex extremely uh, uh, pragmatic, but these are the kind of uh, butcher's cuts. So you're cutting between the tissues and splitting and stitching all the historical uh, contacts in between this. We obviously, that was a consultancy for developer to gain upper hand uh, to get more land. But it's never, that region still not planned. So it's very interesting that how the, um, 
So now I'm going to just show one more project that is actually the Bund. It's uh, not in uh, Shanghai, it's actually in New York. Uh, it's, the site is on Staten Island, uh, which is the, that uh, blotch of red, and that's Manhattan. About uh, the end of last year, uh, Chinese Prime Minister um, Wen Jiabao came to New York, bringing about 20 Chinese developers, including Greenland, Herbaland, all the land guys, Capital Land, and all these developers coming to New York, talk to the state, trying to create project to kind of uh, to sponsor green uh, development. And finally, somehow, the Chinese developers find Staten Island is the most proper place because it's across the Manhattan on the water. Um, so the, uh, the consortium of Chinese developers asked us to give some quick uh, brush of what can be done here. Uh, what do we know about New York? We only know Shanghai. So we thought, uh, why don't we create a project called The Bund? Uh, maybe. <laughs> Maybe that could, uh, could stimulate, start some dialogue on differences. So that's the site. Uh, th that's the first to start. Uh, so this is the site condition now. Uh, so obviously, uh, besides Bund, we also wanted to, uh, to please the Chinese population there by bringing uh, the Chinatownness into the uh, thinking. Uh, but actually, if you think about uh, New York and Shanghai, it's actually not too much uh, far-fetched and that they need a bond that facing Manhattan, rather than Manhattan looking out in the kind of very visible distance, there's like completely suburb of something. And that's, um, so that's the bond, real bond in Shanghai, and that's our area of investigation. It's almost the same, <laughs> that, that part of bond. So that actually helps you to imagine, in that kind of confine of land, what you can achieve, actually. Bond in Shanghai achieve a lot, than, more than that piece of uh, distance. So, and then the, the Shanghai, the really quality of Shanghai is the four elements. That's the Jie, actually, uh, Boulevard, uh, Li Street, uh, Feng Lane, and Nun Alley. So if you... If anybody compare density of Manhattan and Shanghai, you probably find Shanghai holds a lot more people, right? Well, not so, n n uh, besides the fact that many people live in one space, is the hierarchies and the tight knitting of that four level of circulation, commercial, civility, exchange, anything that... So Shanghai actually has four streets that constantly mingle together. That's actually the... Uh, for me, it's the re true reason that Shanghai holds a kind of a, a density and saturated in its structure. It's because those four that Manhattan actually doesn't offer. Manhattan offer avenue, street, and lobbies, right? They cross. Um, so that's basically it. Um, so that's why, although it's physically dense, but it's never as dense as Shanghai or around the Bond area. So actually, we try to bring that four elements into the site and creating a three-dimensional, four-level knitting of the structure and generating, obviously, those are the programs. Uh, street uh, along the, along the uh, Stein Island uh, port. Um, so we actually presented to, um, to, to, uh, to the planning board Amanda Burden, and he goes, why do you guys, such talented design firm, waste your time? I'm like, what do you mean waste time? It's like, Staten Island, hopeless. It's never going to do this because, because uh, I can't control. So, so we have f five sites throughout the city for Brooklyn, Queens, and even closer to Manhattan uh, that actually land has been replanned. The policy and the FAR all changed. Why don't you bring all your uh, Chinese developers onto those land? But I said, well, they don't look like a bond. <laughs> uh, so anyway, so that concludes my talk. Uh, uh, I wanted to then open uh, um, uh, some time for dialogue and questions. And uh, thank you. OK. Um, well, 
thank you, first of all, for the opportunity to respond to uh, Ching Yong Ma's uh, presentation. Uh, it was, I, I had sent email beforehand sort of asking whether I might uh, have a preview of the presentation, but I actually figured he probably didn't know what he was going to say until he got here. So uh, why, why should I expect to know what he was going to say? And I think it's, it's in fact, um, a, a, wonderful, a wonderful thing to uh, experience is just the profuse creativity that uh, is, is uh, embodied in all that uh, Dean Ma uh, undertakes. And it's a, uh, it's a, it's a rich kind of philosophical approach to design and encountering uh, living spaces. And it's a philosophical approach that I think is at one time uh, sort of deeply traditional, I would say Taoist, uh, a very much uh, kind of infusing sort of uh, human uh, experience with the natural environment, but at the same time very forward looking. I would sort of, sort of say a kind of psychedelic Taoist is, is uh, perhaps a way to sort of uh, capture some of the, the essence. And, it, and as I say, there's a kind of profuse creativity. Um, and we see that, that sort of Taoist um, sort of flavor, I think in particular in the Shenzhen uh, case that he gave us with the, with the mountain setting. I, I love the, the idea of the sugar, uh, sugar mountain. You know, and in Rio, of course, they have the uh, uh, famous Pan uh, du this uh, sugar loaf mountain. Um, and, you know, you've created your own and the, the um, the way that it's nestled in place, uh, that, that was really uh, my favorite uh, of, of the projects uh, that were shown there. I think it, it, has, it has a way of, of nesting into the, to the landscape. Um, Dean Ma spoke about um, the sort of the abstraction, looking for abstractions, but in a sense, one of the things that happens is, in, in some ways, abstraction the, the, the very term means pulling something out of. But in, to a certain extent, these were not pulled out. In, in many of these cases, uh, what we see is a kind of um, um, infusion of ideas that were, uh, in a sense, exogenous. So in a sense, not quite abstracted, at least from the setting, as far as I could see. Um, the, ref the reference to uh, Pixelation, I think, is, is uh, very apropos, a kind of three-dimensional pixelation that we saw also in the first uh, uh, Shenzhen case that was um, specified there. The, the one thing that I, I feel that, you know, just as, a, as an overall uh, sense, that, that might be missing at least in the presentation, but perhaps not in terms of how the design is undertaken, is some sense of the, the, the movement of individuals throughout the structures. We, we know that sort of we shape our cities and our sh cities shape us. And I think given the sort of pixelated structure that it would, it would um, suggest that there are opportunities here to do uh, three-dimensional modeling of moves, movement and of paths. What are the paths that individuals might carve through these structures in the course of their daily, uh, daily life? And I think agent-based modeling uh, could fit very well within these kinds of structures. And as far as I know, perhaps that's already being done, but it's not evident. Instead, we've got a sort of an emphasis on these forms and these magnificent and sort of um, stimulating forms, but uh, to the extent it's, that it's just forms for the sake of, of the kind of art and an imposition of art into an urban sphere, um, I'm sort of inclined to go along with that to a certain extent, but uh, perhaps the planner in me wants to know more about how these, how these are actually being experienced by the people who would be dwelling uh, within them. Now, as I mentioned that I didn't beforehand have anything except a title, which was uh, diversity and density. And so trying to sort of 
in a sense, that was very liberating. So I could prepare my commentary uh, without being sort of burdened by actually knowing what Dean Ma was going to say. And so I've prepared a um, commentary just sort of reflecting a little bit about this notion of density. Uh, again, his title was Density and Diversity, and trying to think about um, how that might take place in the context of urban form. So this is just a tiny little um, sort of thought experiment. Uh, if we think of sort of granularity, I think of sort of looking at um, a beach, looking at sand, or even looking down here at the carpet, that from a certain distance, uh, the granularity takes on a certain homogeneity, and it has to do with the scale. This, this thought is actually something that um, was prompted by my early visits uh, to Taipei and sort of experiencing the nature of diversity and the scale at which diversity occurs in Taipei relative to, for example, in Los Angeles. So if we're sort of looking down at, uh, at the, the beach and we're looking down at the granularity of the sand, there's, 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 there's almost a, a kind of homogeneity to it, a, a uniformity to it. But if we begin to focus on a particular spot and begin to zoom in, uh, then we begin to see, uh, as, as the granularity becomes more um, articulated visually, uh, where, where, the, where the scale is sufficient, then we begin to experience the diversity within, the, within that same. So it's like scooping up a, a handful of sand and beginning to examine the bits. Um, and we can continue then to sort of zoom into the spot and again experience these, these the granularity at, at, at a larger, more, uh, more sort of chunky scale. But then as we continue to move in, and this is where I begin to think about something like Los Angeles, where we have a patchwork of municipalities that are relatively homogeneous within them, but at the, at the scale of Southern California as a whole, we have a great deal of, of diversity. But as you move into any particular spot, for example, Arcadia, where I used to live, then as you move further and further in, um, you begin to lose that sense of, of diversity and you're back to where you came from. So in a sense, there is this, it's a question of um, when we're thinking about something like density and diversity in some of these urban spaces, whether they're in China or here in the United States, it, again, it has to do with the, with the um, scale at which we're actually perceiving this. Um, and part of this, I think, has to do as well with movement. Again, it comes back to the way the, it's, it's, it's really not just a question of scale, but it's a question of space and time, and that implies sort of movement through space. So, for example, someone like Dean Ma, who lives a very sort of global existence, the, the granularity of places can be very large. I mean, LA, of course, we, we is very diverse, but LA for someone like Dean Ma, even if it were relatively homogeneous, given that his movement through space brings him into such contact uh, with so many other places, he is experiencing a great deal of diversity through his movement through space and time. So, uh, so then if we take these, these little guys here and we begin to you know, sort of think about any of these, it's not just a question of the scale, but it's a question of the movement through that. So I think there's, there's some great opportunity for taking the, uh, the kinds of ideas that Dean Ma uh, presented to us here in terms of these kinds of structures and sort of pixelated structures in a three-dimensional setting, but then also applying models of mobility within these contexts to sort of enrich our understanding of density and diversity. Thank you. Just quickly about the diagram, I think uh, Eric has very uh, uh, strategically right there over, suppose, uh, kind of concentric circles. Um,
but actually to create a, a difference that is cent cent central figural in the field of granularity, there is actually um, a, a hidden strategy more than uh, actually a, a, a kind of the concentric rings. That's actually embedded in both Kandinsky's um, work and um, Robert Slotsky's analysis on the early, uh, early uh, De Stel, uh, uh universal uh, belief. And although it creates kind of the equal uh, vocal uh, 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 world belief, but actually the center has been always turned off, but it's never really not um, escaped. Anyway, so I just encourage you to think in those centralities, maybe uh, more strategically. That's all. I mean, that's great. So all of a sudden, you have a center. Cool. <laughs> Any questions? Um. Well, I have a question. First off, it's fascinating to see how you, um, as, as Professor Hickel has said, you're so creative with density. But the question is simply this. It doesn't look Chinese to me. I mean, I was wondering, well, so what culture could this be from? You know, without seeing the interiors, I, I can't tell. It looks futuristic, and it, it could, it's, a, it's, like a, it's global. It's not, I, I don't know, do you have any reaction to that? I mean, yes, that's <laughs> I, I, uh, yeah, um, it's very difficult. It's really one of the most difficult to, uh, to debate that could happen, but my simple reaction to it is uh, a global problem has to be, uh, in my mind, has to be addressed and resolved by uh, global approaches. Um, I do think approaches based on a very local um, or culturally local uh, definition, it's probably a comfort of losing the battle anyway. So it's in a way you know you're going to lose, but it's comfortable to embrace it with a cultural uh, position. That's, that's my personal uh, take on that. Uh, in terms of architectural, I do think the uh, traditionality, it's probably a dimension that is really not, uh, should be addressed by architect. Because uh, I know how architect is trained. Every time they address uh, traditionality, they actually uh, simplified and kills it eventually. So it either became an icon or a symbol or all the grotesque things happening around us. So I do think that uh, the cultural, uh, the traditionality, it actually must be addressed through the way they use the space. Um, so I hope that those models, that images, that shows you a kind of basic structure that's global generated actually to, to many of the projects, so exaggerated to a point that is actually could, could even um, uh, 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 disarm the global uh, threat in the city. Uh, yet uh, the life that happens in it uh, can be reorganized. Uh, let me give you an example. Uh, if you go to McDonald's in Hong Kong, uh, uh, you, if, when you watch how the lines form, it's very Hong Kong. It's nothing American. Because American is like uh, three t tailors there. There's one point. Everybody line up to a one point, then goes to your available next one. In China, each of the teller or the servant has a line in front of them. So in a way, the McDonald's operates completely in Chinese way or in Hong Kong way in this matter. Versus, and I think that's that directness of personality with I am lining for you. I'm lining for you. And it resolved a lot, 10 times faster, not 10 times, 10 lines, much faster than it's here. I do, so that's, here is very I impersonal. Uh, you come here, whoever you get, is you get. And, you, and there you actually saw who am I gonna look and you line up. <laughs> There's a choice and the fastness. So this is just example. I think the, the Chinese-ness in this case, or traditionality, hopefully won't lose. Uh, by the fact that it's not addressed formally. But that's, I want to, because that's something that uh, it's every, uh, every lecture or presentation I have. Uh, but uh, to address that, um, I do, am I so confident about what I have said? Uh, probably not. Um, uh, there is another kind of stream of work that uh, myself uh, participated. Uh, if you check the architecture record just now out, 
uh, we just had a house made at the, the record house for the just coming issue. That's uh, a house in uh, Xi'an, outside Xi'an, that I've been building for about almost as long as I have the site. I've been building it every year. So it's a house that's never finished. And uh, so, so, um, yeah, so it's like, a <laughs> so that is constantly involved in local la uh, labor, local material, local everything, kind of just to uh, rely on the uh, building intel uh, intellig local kind of indigenous intelligence in the process and kind of inform our approach that to the uh, 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 urban issue. So hopefully somewhere and down in between that um, we could uh, extract um, points that be shared. But in terms of work, it definitely has that look. Yeah, um, I'm just curious that you talked um, in your talk, given a lot of examples of density, and I'm thinking about the title of the talk, which says density versus diversity. It's almost putting both in opposition of each other. So um, I'm wondering if you could speak more to that uh, opposition, or is it a true opposition, or is, is it a little bit more nuanced, um, and how have you addressed diversity in the projects that you have? But done? obviously in a kind of a traditional line of thinking, Density ignites diversity by default because when it's dense, and then that adja uh, adjacency and proximity that actually create unknown qualities in between. That's we all. That's how cities work. When it's dense, there is more. But it comes to a point that the modern planning practice has basically now using density as part of the equation of um, other things. So densities are now became a quota, became a business tools and it's all that and that kind of when we kind of l looking densely in that way we lose the vision of how diversity is being actually generated so that's one second point uh, to that is that um, I think that's what uh, Eric Professor Hickler was addressing is really amazing so because the the evenness the homogeneity of super densified uh, um, particles kind of generate a, a even field so the kind of centrality has been uh, the differences it's an even field but the differences tends to be overlooked so that's actually the um, so that's actually the second point and lastly is the uh, th uh, what I put there is really to show uh, as a practice or as a at least one type of practice how we uh, um, uh, morph uh, densities into different sites, uh, different urban uh, and different cities. So it has a lot to do with how we um, kind of differentiate our density strategies. Uh, but all those projects absolutely started with maximized density, even more. Uh, developers in China actually love us because we, we, every time we go in, we tell the city, you don't have enough density. You don't have enough density. You don't. So that's the sim, and uh, they immediately say you guys are hired by developer. That's why you are always. I said no, no, no. You don't have density, because you have trained to look densities in a very non-formal, exciting way. This is all became on your deals, right, on the city government. So let us uh, actually create a density for you first. Then you look at, so in many of those incidents, we actually change a lot of the design uh, planning quotas. Uh, that's something I didn't, so when the, when the city administration find, oh, the density actually does look, um, does look uh, less uh, threatening as somewhere in the planning process that density, 35% uh, FARs, 1.5. What it means to the city, how do you organize open spaces? How do you organize all the, so that, that is something that is not in the practice of density, establishment of density, really not in the practice of establishment of density. So in a way that design process then becoming a second round of homework for a lot of city governors, governments in, in China. So that's the last kind of impractical way. Um, Can I ask one question? Yes. Take my prerogative. Um, going back to President Eichler's question about uh, the experience uh, from the street level. Mm -hmm. uh, in the middle of that, uh, 
for the interior the complex or the well no, I'm talking about the more yeah, interior yeah, space, yeah. the urban space. Yeah. Um, and it's kind of like the the um, the dichotomy between Pudong and Pushi. You know, right. both Pudong being able to be used from scratch, they went up basically. And it's a very kind of a Corbusian, you know, super block, you know, the tower and the kind of garden. Whereas in Pushi, they have a lot of high rise buildings and stuff, but they have built into the existing fabric. In fact, I like your one term you used uh, for, I think, the Shenzhen, the expired city. <laughs> I like that. So, but they, they didn't decide to expire that city, they should have kind of built on it. Uh, and, and also the argument of what is the appropriate organization of the new city. And I think it is the Shenzhen, no, sorry, the Zhengzhou, that uh, the, mm -hmm. the screwed up city that we yeah. talked about. That you try to develop a new organization in Zhengzhou by the canal, the, the railroad track, and all the other things. Um, but still what's missing, it seems to me here, and the thing I was trying to put myself in the environment, experience the street level. So if you look at the Manhattan, for example, Manhattan is a huge density. But then Manhattan has a street and the street wall, very wide sidewalk. And it's a one way of experiencing city at the street level. But here, uh, and maybe it's a um, product of our mode of transportation. What you have is a city that is breaking on a very big arterial corridor and they have a large super blocks. And everything happening inside the super block. And that's a, it's a different kind of experience. So I only going to comment on this. Is this sort of continuation of Corbusier's uh, modernist Corbusier, um, uh, the Brasilia tradition of super blocks and towers in the thing versus a, um, what Hans Timmel was trying to do in Berlin, the Lundstadt Berlin, where rebuilding the street wall. But the um, yeah, that's a very good observation. We actually, in the morning, I deliberately cut out all of um, the street level. Because uh, whenever we, we express street level lives, there is somehow the team just put on all the signages, right? All kind of haagen and Starbucks. And they like, in all the renderings, so whenever there's a street, it was just stem stencil like stamps of all the international brand I thought was very embarrassing <laughs> to show those <laughs> to to you all uh, but yes uh, but yeah so it's like all the you know we a lot of street consideration but it's all kind of uh, swamped by the l signs and labels and but um, again I wanted to yeah the obviously I think it's extremely important that uh, city has a very rich uh, uh, not street life, that's guaranteed by whoever lived, but how do you organize and actually encourage the street life uh, per se. Uh, uh, that, but in China, I, I want to make a very simple kind of statement. In China, uh, you never worry a street. Um, it's always going to be extremely populated. So that make our <laughs> work slightly easier. Uh, the, reason our behind, the reason behind our such, I think they're very important. One is actually there isn't uh, a debate of public space versus commercial spaces versus private space. Uh, whenever you talk, of, when you hear those kind of debate, in China it takes totally different meaning. Uh, so here, you know, private space and you know, commercial space and guarded space and all this debate of, in China is seamlessly kind of just blended and grinded together. So in the way that is, um, there's no barrier, visible or visible. Even there's a visible barrier, people would overcome it and it's going to be, cons I mean the street are really used if it's not consumed. So in a way, I think that's in the living tradition, uh, very important to note, right? So whenever there's a debate on public space and democracy and it just doesn't, I mean, old uh, friends that have, you know, tangles under a highway and you know beggars on the overfly bridges, and you can make you just there is this. I think the quality, in terms of the the load uh, use, it's there. Secondly, I, I also think that um, something very important, but it's uh, very hard to debate, and which is the commerciality. 
obviously postmodernism in the West has kind of legitimized that kind of Las Vegasness, right? Through you know through <coughs> Venturi and all this, but it's still today in our context of debate is constantly being kind of problematic. We are forced to take it, but we never really have a strategy to uh, fabricate it into the policy. But in China, commerciality is the driving force. If people cannot exchange, cannot just having a street side uh, herbal and come to the dark looking shiny soup, uh, just turn around and you have a soup. If it that doesn't, it's not in China, I think, uh, that that kind of a commerciality and the kind of illegal, I mean, all this kind of free trading on the very seed level, then you will not uh, have any street. So I think that's the second part. Um, lastly, is the kind of the 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 the, the enclosed space, right? Um, obviously, enclosed space in the West is enclosed space, but in China, if you go there, you would probably notice it's really never. I mean. You can your door will be knocked and Plaza 66 and Brand Mall in Pudong. You have aged people with their plastic bags and sit there for days, right? Just you know, I mean, I mean they could. So there is the still the kind of uh, how the space that extended into the interior space in such a casual, sometimes very messy way in China. <coughs> that all kind of defined, uh, especially defined the street level. Um, in our work, um, we have some kind of rules in our work, we constantly will revisit just to re response. One is that the street has to be connected to the, it's very specific, the street has to be able to connect it to the third and fifth level. And uh, that's actually very key to Chinese planning. In other words, because now you understand the city are not one designed and built once, right? Large areas versus European city. One uh, property, let's see, in Venice or in um, Bot uh, Bot Volterra and all the Italian. So one family has five stories, right, vertical. So, and then the circulation is actually complete, going to spaces that s totally vertical. But in China, that kind of property, right, doesn't exist anymore. So you probably would own the shop next to that tin, and you don't own the ground floor how you are going to be. So creating multiple levels of public access in urban design <coughs> is key. Is, uh, so we, in all our project, we constantly think the f top of five floor has to be another new ground. With new, so retail has to happen again on the sixth level. So the top of fifth level or fifth floor, so on all our project has that. And then second level has to be public access. Those means of egress have to be pulled out of any space directly related to plazas and the so we have all these kind of rules in our project that we concluded last couple of years so just as a design response to that kind of saturated uh, urban kind of street uh, life you mentioned uh, Corbusier and uh, obviously the Unitata Habitation, Habitation uh, comes to mind where they are increasingly internalizing streets within uh, larger buildings. I think uh, Stephen Hall's link uh, hybrid is doing this in um, a more exterior fashion. And uh, as a result, I think um, buildings are more and more internalizing, um, especially in China with rapid urbanization, the, the lack of um, exterior street life. Um, I was curious what your thoughts were on um, an increasingly internalized environment and the effects on the community that result from that. Um, it's it's definitely happening in China, the interior. Right? It's from the world. There's you know uh, a new community to large uh, mega structure that we have involved in a lot of mega structure. Um, so, the um, the potentially your critique on those is like once it's been interiorized, then it lost its kind of um, provision e equal access to uh, to to people. Uh, 
But in China, one thing, I mean, very short, the second commerciality is something Chinese property owners or Asian property owners all wanted. So I have more people and then I, my shops will make more money. So all the accessibility are uh, really kind of guaranteed by the desire to have more people access. So that kind of a very thin vein of exchange of commercial uh, uh, retail, I mean commercial um, desire, it is the kind of problem that is kind of impl uh, indicated. Um, I guess in our design and uh, planning work um, is to understand the mechanism and probably either slow the problem or stop it. But um, I think it's definitely in every project that. Well, can, I, can I just follow through this question? It's okay. really, really short. Make it a comment, but a question. It's a transportation uh, question, which is I was wondering if you had planned that as part of your overall urban design. Now, I don't think your massive towers are designed for bicycles. I can't imagine hordes of bicycles in those narrow corridors. But then I don't think they're designed for cars either. I think it's a pedestrian environment, and maybe it is internalized. It's really localized internal. Do you have, have you brought in the, the concept of transportation access? I mean, and what's the volume that's yeah. attached to that? Right. Um, the, yes, um, the, the first Shenzhen project, the, the parking, <laughs> it is all about uh, parking, well, uh, calculations and where they park. After they park, what they do, right? Yeah. So in that, it's particularly large concentration of parking at the area that is not desired by, uh, this is some rule planning, because when you have your fruit uh, traffic that kind of mapped out through the whole zone, then the commercial values of that spinal kind of structure will be raised this tall. So we mapped all the lowest commercial values area. Those are the kind of map zones of parking, massive parking, underground, four levels actually. And that's kind of the idea is to kind of stop uh, all the parking on the perimeter and sunk and really low. So every then that's why the towers are also perimeter. So the uh, immediately it goes to there. And then the, the inner core of it uh, is actually foot traffic three-dimensionally from a parking lowest to up, up, up into hit. That is actually the strategy there in the first project. The Zhengzhou project is a very flat city, has no uh, finance, infrastructure finance to do any infrastructure work on the ground. That project has the highest road density. In other words, like the uh, the kind of exaggeration of road density in that project to allow flexibility. So we actually, div um, the road sections are def uh, defined in such that actually could be altered as the practice goes, because it's a very flat land. So guarantee the highest road density to start with. That's why the building blocks and are very, very tiny. So that way, uh, it's a kind of a flexibility in response to future need. Um, the, obviously, if we would study the traffic so thoroughly, we actually can pinpoint of the road density by four hierarchical orders would offer you this structure. I, I think that's theoretically doable. But given what China is and Zhengzhou is, you probably would serve, do a bad service for the city if you actually do that because the growth and the tendency of the, the investment in public structure, it's so unknown. So our strategy is, okay, let's just provide the most flexible, uh, responsive possible re uh, structure. That's actually on the road, and also road section. So, and uh, that, I think that's really, uh, every project has that um, kind of consideration in it, but I didn't show it just because uh, the images looks not uh, not uh, not cool. Thank you very much. Okay. <laughs>